17 minutes past the hour here in Queensland, which means it's also 17 minutes past the hour in WA and Victoria, New South Wales and Tasmania. That's the hour is different in all of those places. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the outhouse. Uh, my name's Pete Smith, uh, orator and telemarker, and it's great to have you along for our 27th episode. And I'm very excited to uh, welcome uh, Henry Kelsey from uh, Wilderness Equipment to uh, tell a bit of their story. Um, just before Henry does that, uh, I'd like to acknowledge um, First of all, the traditional owners of the land, and I'll throw that over to Henry Friend to do that, if you wouldn't mind, Henry. Thanks, Pete. Uh, inside the outhouse, we'd like to acknowledge uh, uh, the traditional owners of the land on all country in Australia, their elders past and present. And we'd like to make a special mention, of course, being in the outdoors as our professional space, the importance that um, all outdoor educators have to promoting and maintaining country uh, and highlighting the Indigenous connection to the land. Uh, thanks, Henry. Um, and I'd just like to acknowledge the uh, tireless work of the management team of the Art House, uh, Cherie Mullen, David Maskell, Henry Friend, and Ellen Barker uh, for their tireless work in promoting and uh, working on the technical and other aspects of this great resource, which I have no idea about those aspects. Um, without any further ado, I'm going to throw over to Henry Kelsey uh, from WE and he will tell us a story, I hope. Thanks, Henry. Thank you all. And uh, can I just say thank you for having me inside the outhouse once again. It's always a pleasure to, uh, to get the, the message and the invitation. And I'm very happy to be here today to talk about the story of wilderness equipment. Um, for those of you who haven't met me in person or don't know me, I'm the, the second generation of wilderness equipment being Ian's son. And uh, I'll be, you know, talking about that as a part of the middle of our history. But um, to kick things off, I'm going to take us all the way back to 1974 and have a bit of a chat about how it all started. And then I'm going to bring us forward from there. Uh, I've also got a few products um, to show you from the archives uh, so I can do some direct comparisons between things that we made you know um, 20 or 30 years ago and things that we have now so you guys can see uh, what it means to you know have a brand which has got one one designer for you know, more than 40 years which is pretty unique so where did we where do we start we started here in um, in Western Australia actually not far from where I'm sitting I live in Nedlands and uh, my father Ian grew up in Nedlands just on the other side of the highway. Back in the early 70s in Western Australia, uh, there, weren't, there wasn't such thing as, a, as an outdoor store. It's not like you could go down to your local independent outdoor store or, you know, Paddy Palin or, or whatever and go and buy the latest and greatest in uh, technical outdoor equipment. It was really just, you know, army surplus and uh, like yachting stores. And so everything that you needed to get outside was a bit of a workaround. So for dad getting into um, the outdoors and particularly getting into, into caving and, and bushwalking and cycle touring here in WA, access to good equipment was absolutely a bit of a problem. So the first thing that he ever made was a tent. It um, was called the, the TR tent, which means transverse ridge. And it was essentially a copy of a Fjall Raven tent that he'd seen a drawing of in a mail order catalog in a scout shop. And he looked at it and he went, wow, that's, you know, many months of my salary to, you know, order a tent sight unseen mail order from, um, from Sweden. And he thought with no sewing experience whatsoever, you know what, I reckon I can make that. So, <laughs> so it took him two weeks to get the, uh, get the fabrics together and then another two weeks to work out how to sew it, you know, how to cut the panels up uh, and how to build it. So it was a bit of a, a month long process. And that was it, that was, the, that was the, original, the original tent. 1976 saw him uh, traveling around Australia, um, cycle touring and, uh, and bushwalking in Tasmania and living in that tent, uh, you know, most nights of that, out of that year. There was a particularly pivotal moment down in Tassie where uh, they were cycle touring and a storm came through and 
all of the other tents in the campground uh, were flattened or inundated with rain, except for dad's tent, which um, stood up to it. And it just so happened that there was a, there was a guy there at that time who said, you know what, my, my cousin owns an outdoor store in Sydney called Norski, and he would definitely sell your tents. So, uh, so dad, who was in the middle of his university studies at this time, drove back across the Nullarbor back to Western Australia, dropped out and started making equipment full time. Now, making equipment full time meant uh, setting up a small production facility, if you want to call it that, with two sewing machines in the spare room of my Nana's house and um, began making panniers and day packs and um, filling down into continental quilts as a little bit of a sideline business. And it was at this time uh, when, you know, early 70s, um, scruffy outdoors people were coming and going from the house in Perth suburbia um, with a you know, great frequency that one of the neighbours tipped off and went, you know what, I reckon that maybe, um, maybe Ian's capitalising on his parents being away on their retirement trip by selling a bit of mull. So uh, one day, the, um, a couple of detectives from the drug squad knocked on the door, said we've, um, we've had uh, information that there's been uh, people you know, coming and going frequently from this property and we'd just like to do a bit of an inspection to see if you've got any drugs on the premises. So in they came. Uh, Dad said that they were doing things, you know, like opening up the, the tea jar in the kitchen and, you know, smelling it and going, oh, what's this? And he goes, oh, it's tea. It's like, yeah, it smells like tea. And um, it, they were not at all expecting to find rolls of fabric and sewing machines and, you know, other, other, uh, other equipment for making, um, you know, panniers and, and, and uh, bags and, and quilts. And they were quite bewildered to find that it actually wasn't a small scale, scale uh, drug operation uh, going on in the, in the house in Netherlands. So he was there for a little while and then in um, 1979 moved into a... Um, uh, home in, uh, in, sorry, into an old warehouse rather, which was a short-term home in the west end of Fremantle, in what is now uh, the administration building for the Notre Dame University uh, Medical School. We've obviously got, you know, an, a, a close connection to the Notre Dame Uni here, being uh, the West Australian sort of outdoor education university, and also sharing um, what was what was once once our home with uh, the university campus there, and then. Um, from there, 1983, moved into a long-term home in, um, in North Fremantle on Jewel Parade, which is uh, a factory that many people will remember. Um, those West Australians present would, um, would re potentially remember going into WN North Fremantle to buy equipment. And I certainly remember being a small child, being too small to actually um, wear wilderness equipment, wilderness equipment and spending a lot of time on the sewing machines there as a, you know, six, seven, eight-year-old making my own gear because I wasn't quite tall enough for dads. <laughs> it was a very, very proud moment when I finally, finally was big enough to get um, my dream pack, which was a tour jour and a size small. And even then I was still a little bit too small for it. And I could start wearing wilderness equipment proper and not just Henry equipment. As a side note, I was, I was allowed as much um, as much webbing and, and as many buckles as I wanted, but I was only allowed fabric out of the scrap spin because obviously um, you know, fabric's a little bit more expensive than webbing. And with buckles, uh, Dad knew that if I made something crap, he could just cut all the um, buckles back off it and reclaim them back into uh, normal production. <laughs> so we, um, we finished up our production in, um, in Australia in October, 1999. And um, it's interesting to think about that now because it's more than 20 years ago. And it sort of seems like one of those things where you go, oh, well, that was sort of a recent memory. And you go, oh, you know, 2000 seems like it wasn't that long ago, but, but now it's a, a quite a substantially long time ago. And I want to talk about the kinds of things that we were making in, um, in WA, in North Fremantle, and I guess what, how we've changed as a, as a bit of a business from then. So back in the day, we made a lot of, made a lot of Gore-Tex apparel. And um, we were very proud to be recognised as the gore manufacturer with the lowest warranty return rate in Australia. And um, we were also heavily involved with gore in uh, helping them to 
basically nail down what their best practices would be for quality control. So a lot of the things that are now standard procedure for Gore-Tex closing manufacturers were developed by Ian, you know, in the small factory in North Fremantle. So things like, um, you know, when we seam tape a garment, and these are things that we do currently on our non-Gore-Tex garments, when you seam tape a garment, same tape goes through the roller, but when you cross over joining seams, you have a little bit of extra thickness. And it's at these points that you basically need to do a hot press as well. But when you're looking at a garment, you know, how do you know that all of those little corner junctions have actually been pressed? Um, and we used to do a quality control check on that by cutting out a little circle of extra seam tape. And when we're doing that hot press to press it onto there. So I'm sure that everyone who's in this session right now has a Gore-Tex jacket, probably not far from them. And if you open that up, you might notice lots of little circles on all of the, all of the junctions. And that's a little QC check that was developed here in Western Australia, which is now being used by um, most reputable gore manufacturers worldwide. Uh, something really sad happened though in the late 90s, which was that Gore-Tex decided that they um, were going to revoke all of their small manufacturing licenses worldwide and um, sort of consolidate production with big American brands. So we were swept up in that and all of a sudden, uh, a really big part of our business, um, which you needed to have a license to make, we weren't able to make anymore. And so that meant that from being really a, a business that was primarily a clothing manufacturer, but also making tents and backpacks and panniers on the side, we had to really think about how we were going in that. Um, along with the Australian government tariff um, protection removal, which allowed for um, a lot of uh, international brand entry into Australia, meant that we had to take the step to move our production offshore to Vietnam, where we have now been proudly manufacturing for more than 20 years. So we're really happy to have um, to reach that benchmark and we're particularly happy at the moment um, with everything that's going on in the world to be working um, with our people in Vietnam and not have um, not having any of our production lines in China as some people do. Um, another interesting thing is that the sort of vernacular of um, things that we say as outdoors people and, and where they've come from. So another sort of gore story is um, back in the early 90s, uh, prior to Gore-Tex introducing their guaranteed to keep you dry um, warranty, which you see on everything and I've seen on everything for the last 15 years, they went, we need to decide what our product categories are going to be and we need to come up with some names for these. And so they went, oh, well, Ian, do you have some ideas and put the heads together and came up with this, the idea of a category called fast and light. Now we talk about, you know, things being fast and light all the time, going fast, going light. And this is a sort of idea that has been widely propagated everywhere and we use all the time that came from a gore category definition in the early 90s that was sort of written down on a piece of paper and went, oh, yeah, I think that'll stick. So we'll, we'll go with that. So it's really interesting the way that these, um, these ideas seem to um, play out over time. Okay, so where are we now? Our product range comprises of, you know, all of the things that you guys know and love. Our backpacks, our tents, and a little bit of clothing. But one thing that is happening that's coming back in for 2021, which is going to be very exciting, is a return of our cycle touring range. So we're bringing panniers back in. And I have some examples of our testing samples here to show you. And I'll now move on to a, um, a part of the presentation where I'd like to talk about um, idea development, uh, how products have changed over time and have a look at, um, I guess, consistencies of ideas and then places where things have changed. So I'll start out with a show and tell of a pannier, which is from... Mm. Uh, very, very early on. Now, this is from the late 70s. And we know this because if you look at this logo, it predates the triangular wilderness equipment logo, which came in a little bit later. So it just says wilderness equipment manufactured in Western Australia. 
my auntie gave these to me and I just pulled this out of the shed and you can see that we have a very basic, um, basic attachment system. Now, the shape makes sense as a rear pannier shape. And when we look at our pannier range over all time, that's as a style is something that's been maintained. And if I grab now a 2021 testing pannier, you can see that it's essentially the same shape. This one's canvas, whereas that one's synthetic. But a lot of those features that we nailed down early on have been maintained. But what we have done is we've thought about what is the problem with, with panniers. And the problem is having an attachment system to a rack, which is really secure and will be great if you want to like ride around the world but is equally good if you just want to ride down to the shops. So we, rather than um, using an off the shelf pannier um, component system, have developed our own system with this swiveling cam lock. So you can get a direct engagement onto the bar of your pannier uh, while still having really easy removal. We've got these extruded aluminium rails, which means that your uh, hooks there can be moved laterally along the bar, which means that no matter which kind of rack you've got, you're gonna be able to get a really, really excellent connection. And uh, you're also gonna be able to add a bit of structural rigidity to the bar because we have a frame sheet in the pannier with absolutely no flex. So that's a, that's a thing where we've gone, okay, well, we started making panniers in the late seventies. Um, shape is a pretty easy thing uh, to determine and we've nailed that shape down really early in the piece. But then as with all WE products, we don't make things to try to, you know, exploit a, a market segment or, you know, make more money or, you know, the better massive company. We just try to solve problems that we see when we use gear ourselves, um, which we also think will help um, solve the problems faced by other people. So we've maintained that bag shape and we've come forward to what we can see as the best possible idea for a panning and mounting system is. And we've been rigorously testing that um, over the past couple of years. And we're now happy that we're gonna be able to release that uh, into the wild, so to speak, um, early next year. So that's, um, that's a really nice little progression. Uh, another thing that I have to show you is, um, one of the first low carrying packs that we ever made because we didn't make packs in the very beginning. When, uh, when Ian started out in 1976, you know, we we're making panniers and we we're making tents, we we're making a bit of clothing, we we're making some day packs. But when you really think about it, fundamentally we were a cycle touring brand to begin with. And then um, in the very early eighties, we started making low carrying packs when, um, you know, as all things, um, come into um, the world with wilderness equipment products when either in that case Ian or myself have um, seen a way where we can improve a, upon what is currently available or we've had a completely um, you know completely new idea for something so here I have a pack from the very early 80s you can see that now the logo has moved along just a touch and you can see the first iteration of the um, the wilderness equipment logo so this one was made in north fremantle not fremantle and this pack has got a harness arrangement that you can kind of see a similarity to in what we currently do it's just that what we currently do has been bulked up more significantly this pack has got the ax frame in it which is what is currently used in all wilderness equipment packs like the breakouts and the lost welds and the prions that you guys would know but we've moved along with our ideas in terms of the shoulder harness and the hip harness you can see that the hip harness on this is basically a belt and it's not actually going to do much to load your hips so in you know 1982 this was the best um the best idea that could come up with and then fast forwarding to my current pack, you can see that we've got the same frame system, but we've got a carefully sculpted and contoured shoulder harness. And then we have our synchro form 
hip harness, which is the only uh, harness available made by anyone that has independently rotating hip wings that are fundamentally important for maintaining natural hip movement and excellent direct load transfer onto either side of the spine on the top of your, of your glute muscles. So you can see that in the case of PAX, the first idea, um, which was the AX frame system that came in the first PAX that we made, that's still maintained here in 2020, but everything else has come forwards in terms of materials, technology, um, the hardware, you know, like we don't use any metal buckles anymore because a lot of uh, Australian um, outdoor pursuits happen near the ocean. Like, you know, for example, last weekend, I was down in Walpole next to the sea on a bushwalk. And when you're doing things in a maritime environment, you really want to avoid metal hardware um, as much as you can because uh, well, it rusts and it's just another thing that needs to be maintained. So that constant evolution of ideas continues every single time that we go outside with our gear on. And that's how you see the evolution of, um, of wilderness equipment products happening. It's not about making a new thing every single year to have something that's shiny that looks nice on a shelf. It's all about going, what's going to be the best possible thing to keep people comfortable, safe and happy in the outdoors. And that's, you know, that's me, that's my family, that's a friend, that's, that's our friends in the greater outdoor, outdoor and outdoor education community and just trying to make sure that we can pay, keep, um, you know, uh, everyone really having great outdoor experiences. So I guess that's pretty interesting from an um, evolution point of view. But then uh, there's lots of things that we do that are outside of, um, of I guess, the ranges that, that people know about. Uh, there's, all, there's been niche products over, over the years, uh, which are no longer in the range now. And there's also things that we do which um, are directly um, designed by us, but you won't see on the Wilderness Equipment website. So to provide a historical example, here is a WE climbing harness. It's a Wilderness Equipment Grampian. It's a um, 80 mil webbing harness that I probably wouldn't want to take a whipper in because it um, probably wouldn't be very comfortable. Um, but that's something that we, you know, we've made back in the day uh, and we, we don't make any more. Flipping the coin a little bit, uh, working um, outside of the recreation field and working in um, like military soft goods, every single Australian soldier wears a jacket that was designed by Ian. So we make the, um, the GP jacket that the Australian Army uses. Doesn't have a WE logo on it, um, but it's something that has been worked on as a special project um, by dad. And while you won't see it on, the, um, on our website, uh, you will see it, you know, out there, out there in the field. So we're always trying to um, do the best that we can to make sure everyone's comfortable outside. And um, that's a fundamental part of who we are. I guess another thing that's really important to us beyond human comfort is environmental impact and making sure that um, we can protect uh, the places that we hold really, uh, really close to, to our hearts. I'll talk about, I guess, what, what the ideology is for wilderness equipment in terms of environmental impact, but I'll also talk about um, historically what, um, what we have done. So back in the mid seventies, uh, there began um, the extensive clear felling of a, um, you know, a great patch of uh, Southwest Western Australian forest. The kind of forestry um, wars probably most heavily publicized in um, Tasmania, but we all, I think, have had uh, fights closer to home to protect our um, local forest spaces. Um, in 1976, um, in direct uh, opposition to uh, logging companies, the Southwest Forest Defence Foundation was formed. And that is a, um, essentially a um, forest protection lobbying group uh, that we've been in support of and um, certainly Ian has been a part of um, since the beginning. And through working with the Southwest Forest Defence Foundation, we've, um, and with the support of um, philanthropic donations, uh, we have 
what the Southwest Forest Defence Foundation has managed to uh, protect big chunks of Western Australian forest. And uh, that, um, you know, historic protection has resulted in uh, the formation of a lot of the national parks that we now see um, today in Western Australia. So that's something that we're very proud to have been able to support historically. And if we look, um, uh, if we look to where we sit now and we think about, okay, environmental impacts, how can we minimise them? As a brand, we're overwhelmingly aware that um, the things that we make, yeah, they're made from non-renewable resources. And that's something that it isn't really possible to get around right now in a meaningful way because we can't get the same performance um, out of renewable um, fibres presently um, that we can out of non-renewables. So where does that leave us as individuals and as a company who have a great respect for and rely upon um, you know, the, the natural environment, both from a business point of view, but also just to keep us um, healthy and happy? It means making things that last as long as possible. So when it comes to tents, for example, um, most tent manufacturers use standard polyurethane coatings uh, on their floors. And anyone in here who um, has had a tent go sticky, um, particularly maybe uh, some of our friends in Queensland where it's a little bit more humid, it's more prone to happen, you'll understand that you know, that is the result of a normal formulation polyurethane breaking down under attack by water. We use an ether-based uh, coating in our polyurethanes, and that means that wilderness equipment tents don't go sticky. And so that means that they don't make it into the bin with as great a frequency as, as other brands, which means that um, we sell less of them, probably not a great business model, but it also means that less non-renewable resources have been consumed. So we think, okay, we're using non-renewables, but if someone buys, say, one wilderness equipment tent instead of three of someone else's, then that's a way better outcome for the planet because less has been consumed to begin with and less is going into landfill. It's a great outcome uh, for you know, the person who's bought that because it means that they've you know, spent probably three times less money on replacing gear. And it's also a great outcome for us because we get to you know, do this and I get to be here in this session talking about the fact that we do this. <laughs> um, from a pack point of view, you know, we talk about um, you know, exactly the same ideas of, of making choices specifically for things to last as long as possible. And in the case of our canvas packs, um, we're using a material there which can be guaranteed when correctly cared for to pretty much last forever. So there's no reason why you couldn't go out and you know, buy one of our canvas packs today and look after it and be using that for the rest of your life. It's not a guarantee that can be made with synthetic packs because of the way the, um, the fabric is made. Basically, you have a um, polyurethane coating on a bit of fabric. And as soon as that coating degrades, the fabric loses its strength and stability and the seams fall apart. So we can't have a synthetic pack last longer than 20 years, but canvas can you know, go for decades. And um, it's you know, obviously much more expensive to begin with. But again, if you have to buy one pack over the course of 40 years instead of eight, again, better thing for the environment, better thing for the user, better thing for us. So we really focus on making sure that we make things as well as we possibly can so that they will last for as long as they possibly can, understanding textiles, um, engineering the limitations of the things that we're working with to make sure that us and you guys and outdoors people in Australia and um, also as we expand internationally around the world get to have great experiences outside where they're comfortable and happy and safe and um, get to use gear that lasts a very long time so it becomes a part of their stories rather than being something that's consumed and tossed away. Uh, that's pretty much me. Uh, I'll open it up now. If anyone's got any questions, I'd be happy to field them. Uh, thanks, Henry, for that uh, insightful presentation. I personally think those cycle panniers with the adjustable uh, point where you hang because uh, you, you ride a different bike and it has a different rack and it yeah it's a pain in the ass 
Um, anyway, um, uh, so I thought, I, I think that's a great innovation. Um, so you effectively have, just in terms of clothing, your organization has gone away from all gore wear now. Do you make any gore wear? Or can you talk a little bit about the clothing you do make and its features? Yeah, absolutely. So we don't we don't make any uh, any gore apparel any longer, and there's a couple of reasons for that. And the first is is around licensing. So to make Gore-Tex clothing, you need to have a gore license, and you know to to get one of those licenses, you need to make certain criteria. I think that most of the criteria to um, you know to to get a gore license really come around being able to meet volume. So if you're a large uh, multi-door retailer, really easy to get a gore license because you're going to be able to sell lots of jackets and um, in turn, you're going to be able to buy lots of Gore-Tex fabric. Um, for us, with our focus on uh, working um, to meet the needs of sort of specific users, we definitely don't meet the criteria to sell, um, you know, such a huge volume as to, as to get a license. Um, but instead what we do is, you know, so we make our, our deluge rain jacket, which is optimised for outdoor education fleet use. We've we made a, you know, a raincoat which uses uh, a polyester rather than a nylon facing fabric. And we're using a polyester because, as you guys know, when you wash jackets, the DWR pretty much goes away. And if you've got a jacket in a fleet that's getting washed um once a week and is in the field for hundreds of days per year, DWR maintenance is, is sort of more theoretical than realistic. And um, so we're using a polyester yarn because polyester doesn't absorb water, whereas nylon does. So when a DWR is gone, you want to have a polyester yarn instead of a nylon one. If it doesn't absorb water, it also doesn't cling on to mud, so it's easier to clean and dries more quickly, so it's not as heavy when it's wet. And those are the things that we think about when we go, okay, well, what do outdoor, what do outdoor educators need to a keep kids warm and dry and b um, get those things clean and back out in the field with a really really quick turnaround so we just try to think about okay well what are the requirements for our people rather than you know like what can we make that's gonna be fashionable and you know be be nice to wear when you go get a latte so <laughs> we've got yeah so we've got the deluge jacket in the range now and we've got a you know set of pants the rain dance pants which meet exactly the same wear criteria and um are built specifically for the needs of outdoor education. With the addition of a um, 100 gram pullover um, fleece, that's pretty much the extent of our clothing range at the moment. Henry, you, um, you said that synthetic doesn't last as long as natural fibers. Is yep. synthetic got advantages in terms of the lightweightness of packs or is that more related to the add-ons like the frame and the padding and the optional features? Um, you talk about that perhaps. Okay, um, so what I will um, do is I'll share a link with you guys to a, um, a video that is on our, um, on our website, which makes a direct comparison basically between um, canvas fabric and synthetic fabric. And while it is a, um, a comparison that uh, is comparing like for like, so it's uh, comparing like a canvas with a heavier weight um, synthetic fabric. It is quite interesting in terms of um, fabric construction and, and those kinds of things. So I'll just chuck that in here. Okay. So fundamentally, canvas gets its performance from how tightly woven it is. So if you look at a raw piece of unfinished canvas, uh, it'll look almost just like a sort of hessian or calico, but really, really tightly woven. And in that state, it doesn't have any kind of waterproof coating on it. It is going to be waterproof. Interesting thing about canvases versus synthetics is that the standard test for waterproofing, which is sealing a bit of fabric over the end of a, a tube and trying to pump water through it, it, canvas can't pass that test. But then somehow it's managed to get this really great reputation for um, performance in wet weather. And it simply comes down to the fact that rain, you know, falls pretty hard, um, but it certainly doesn't um, fall as hard as the, uh, you know, 
testing procedures that we have in place for testing things like tent waterproofing. Um, because of the fact that it gets that uh, waterproofing from its incredibly tight wave, wave, it means that you have to have yarns of a certain size, which means that it's going to be a, um, a certain weight. Whereas when you go, okay, uh, synthetic fabric, you can use much lighter yarns because essentially you're just making a mesh or a, a grid, like a, a woven grid, which you then put plastic on the back of. So that gets its, um, its performance, its strength, and its waterproofing from the fact that you've got a plastic in combination with a weave. And that means that you can go much, much lighter. But the problem with that is that um, because the strength doesn't come from the integrity of the weave and rather comes from a, another process to stick something on, um, when you stick something on, it can come off again. So it means that once you have that coating breakdown, then those yarns are not stabilized and all of the tensile strength is gone. And you can say that on things like, um, you know, if you've ever had a tent go, um, go sticky, you can sort of feel like um, it's, uh, it, it, if the coating's actually come off, you can say that the yarn stability is gone. Or if you've had a really old synthetic pack, generally what will happen is that once that um, yarn stability and tenacity is gone, the seams will actually come apart because the fabric isn't strong enough for the seams to be um, integral anymore. And, you know, this is true of, you know, not just all, uh, not just wilderness equipment canvas packs, but all canvas packs will, will last significantly longer than um, synthetic packs, just purely based on materials engineering. Um, it's, so, so they're no definitely, uh, they're definitely more recommended for the Australian environment than a European or, um, Asian environment, like is it is it climatically related or is it just? So it's a, it's an excellent question. Um, I think that we we definitely have a bit of a canvas pack culture here in Australia because we also have that swag culture. So everyone's uh, comfortable with canvas as a material. But in terms of where it's appropriate to use it and where it isn't appropriate to use it, it, it is a performance fabric. And there's a great many reasons why you would use it everywhere on earth. So to provide a bit of an example from personal experience, because canvas doesn't have that um, polyurethane coating on it, it means that the fabric can allow moisture to escape. So if I'm on a trip for, you know, like 12 days or something, and I'm sure everyone else has had this experience as well, when you have damp gear going in and out of a pack, if you're using a, um, a synthetic pack, you are essentially putting things inside a plastic bag. And so the humidity of the environment inside your pack is quite high. And you get that sort of like damp gear stew kind of thing going on. Whereas with a canvas pack, because moisture can escape, damp gear going inside the pack can actually dry out and, um, and lose its moisture through the wave. And I guess the most direct example that I can that I can provide of this happening and probably the best advertisement for buying any kind of canvas pack that I can think of is one day I um, went for a surf and uh, I got, got out of the water, I uh, took my wetsuit off and um, I was in a dirt car park and it sort of, uh, I wasn't very careful and I got sand all over my wetty and I didn't want to put it into the boot of my car and get sand everywhere and I didn't have a bucket or anything to put it into but I did have one of our traverse day packs and I went oh I'll, I'll just chuck it in there and so I put it in there and then for whatever reason I, I went somewhere else I didn't go straight home I got home and I pulled my board out of the car but I completely forgot about my wetsuit and my wetty normally hangs up on a line undercover around the side of my house and so it was like a couple of days later I went oh time for a surf and I couldn't find my wetty I was like where is it it's, it's not in a spot where it always lived and then I remember oh Henry you idiot you left it in the bag in the car and I was thinking back to you know like primary school um swimming carnival like phys ed where you put your boardies into a plastic shopping bag only to discover them sort of days later and you know sort of starting to starting to create their environment and I went and grabbed the um grabbed the traverse day pack out of the boot of the car and I pulled the wetsuit out and um it was completely dry and basically it had just been inside the canvas bag uh inside the car and, you know, it's Perth temperature, so you know, spring temps inside Perth cars can, you know, they can get upwards of 40 degrees without even trying. And all the moisture had just vented straight out through the bag, through the, through the canvas fabric, which was, which was close. And I pulled my 
my wetsuit um, out, dry, still smelling like a wetsuit, but certainly, um, you know, not the sort of crazy, you know, like mildewy environment that I was expecting to uh, expecting to find. So um, that's a, I think, a really good um, show of like a sort of a capsule of um, of canvas performance. Which then, when you think about going and using a canvas pack um, out in the bush for extended periods of time, and think about the question of which kind of environments can they be used in and which are they optimal, which are they optimal? And you go, okay, well, let's think about Southeast Asian jungles and incredibly humid environments. It's great to have a, um, a breathable waterproof pack like that, because it means that you're, you know, you, you're always going to be having damp gear, but at least it's getting the opportunity to actually lose some of its moisture. And then, um, you know, at the same time, you think about, well, you know, Europe, you go, okay, well, you know, lots of places in Europe, it rains a lot. And particularly like, you know, having been up in, in Scotland and thinking about, you know, what the weather's like up there, it's a, it's a perfect place to be using a canvas pack as is the Pacific Northwest, like Vancouver Island, because any, any place that you've got incessant rain and high humidity, it's great to have a breathable backpack, which is going to allow moisture to escape. Yeah. I hope, that makes, I hope that makes sense. But if anyone's got any questions, please uh, hit me up. Um, Henry, what's your what's your favorite piece of equipment that Wilderness Equipment makes? Since, you, since you've been around for, for quite some time, um, what's been your favorite they've made over the years? My, my favorite, favorite ever piece of equipment. Um, so when I was very small and I was too small to, um, use wilderness equipment. The pack that I wanted was a tour jour, which is um, a like 40 litre uh, day ski touring pack. And the name tour jour is a bit of a sort of Ian Maley conjugation from French because like it's like tout le jour, which means, you know, all, all of the day and then ski tour. So it's tour. So he made tour jour, which is a, you know, all day ski tour and you know being a um, western australian child living thousands of kilometers from the snow there was nothing more that i wanted than a than a tour jour including the um the ice axe sleeves which of course i'd have absolutely no use for but i just thought it was the coolest pack ever and i wanted the red one and i wanted the ice axe sleeves and when i um when i finally was big enough and dad gave me my first wa pack he gave me a tour jour and i was wrapped but i got the green one and it didn't have the axe sleeves so there was still like a little, you know, piece of disappointment there. But um, that was a size small and I grew out of it. More recently, uh, one of my mates, Tom, sent me a, a link um, to a Gumtree ad for a red tour jour for 150 bucks in Perth. So I went off and I went and bought it secondhand. And that green pack that I showed you guys before, I also, also bought that on Gumtree. So I'm always out, you know, on Gumtree finding... Um, finding vintage wilderness equipment for the collection because um, I think that it's important to have a few pieces to refer to and you know talk about. Um, but the Tour Jour uh, I think is has been the most important um, pack in uh, for me uh, in um, in my lifetime. And you know when I was down uh, out in Walpole on the weekend, I was out for two nights with some friends trying to find a waterfall um, which is four kilometre bush bash from the nearest trail and there's absolutely um, no sign of it existing either on um, a one to 50,000 map or on um, Google satellite images. I was um, using my tour jewel pack and yes, I did find the waterfall. <laughs> Is there, um, do you guys not keep a stock of your old equipment? There's not a museum that was and didn't put things no. aside? No, because, um, because the thing is that because of how our development works and how the design process works, you know, we, we build the best possible idea that we can come up with and then that idea gets refined through, through use. So, you know how you think about, oh, like, you know, um, during the day, you, you'll, you'll think of, you'll come up with ideas at like the worst possible time. I think in day-to-day -day life, you'll, you'll come up with ideas like in the shower or if you're out, out for a run. But when you're designing outdoor equipment, the time when you come up with ideas is always, you know, like if you're standing on the side of a mountain and it's sort of sleeting sideways and, and then something, and then you have a problem with something and you go, oh, well, here's an opportunity to improve. 
And so, you know, in the early years, we go, all, we, we always bear the brunt of um, uh, bad ideas which get put to the side. And anything that makes it, you know, out into the world is, is the best possible thing that we can come up with. So understanding that, um, there's no nostalgia from Ian in terms of, um, well, I think actually now he is getting a little bit, um, he, he does like me, seeing me getting things off, um, off Gumtree, but in terms of using it, he goes, okay, well, um, that was my idea before and this is my idea now. And then he'll use his, that idea until a new one comes along. So he's always evolving down the track and I'm always evolving down the track to always be testing the thing that we've come up with. Um, and then when you do that, it means that you, there's a limited amount of space, you know, in the, um, in the workshop in which you can actually hold on to things. And so, um, you know, they get, get sold to, to friends or, or donated um, to, to schools or, you know, um, we, we just, yeah, haven't really held on to things over the years. But I think it's important and that's why I'm trying to build up a bit of a, a back catalogue of early products. Um, just also because it's nice that when we do things like go to the National Outdoor Ed Conference, we can have a few of those like really old pieces to refer to just because it's nice. Even if we think that we've moved on functionally a great deal from those things. I think that's the most humbling thing I've ever heard is that somebody's buying their own gear secondhand on Gumtree. <laughs> do, you, do you tell the people who you are when you go buy the equipment? Oh, yeah, totally. And, um, you know, for the most part, people are like, oh, that's like, that's really, it's nice that it's going home. And then in, yeah. the, in the case of this Tour Jour pack that I bought, I'm the fourth owner, if you count Ian as the original owner when it was, you know, in the factory. So, so it's... Um, it's interesting that it goes around in a circle like that. And it's, it's also awesome. nice that, you know, I can buy things that will be, you know, that pack when I bought it, it's the 2001 model. So it's 19 years old. And it's also, I guess, like a, a real um, show of quality and longevity. The fact that someone can sell a backpack that's 19 years old and be like, well, this is, this is a reasonable thing that someone's going to pay good money for. And um and then, you know, I come out and pay good money for it. <laughs> um, and if we look at things like, uh, you know, Dave, um, Jamie, you asked about, do I have an um, old SAS pack to show off? And, um, you know, back in the 80s, um, we've got the um, SAS barracks down here in Swanbourne. And, um, you know, Dad made uh, this legendary military pack, the SAS pack, um, which, you know, all of the old SAS guys talk about. And um, I actually do have one. I just don't have it um, here at home to show you, unfortunately. But um, these packs originally in the 80s, they sold for like 500 bucks or something. And now they sell on eBay for over a thousand. So we've got a situation where there's a pack that's sort of so iconic um, in that community that they're that absolutely thrashed ones are sort of selling for more than they were worth brand new. It's like, it's sort of this crazy, crazy notion, which is pretty cool to see. And it's also interesting, I guess, to carry forward on, you know, talking about special projects, you know, and things that we do outside of wilderness equipment. Um, the Australian Army at the moment's got a big problem with, um, they don't have a backpack that is, um, is good for female soldiers and a lot of female soldiers are getting injured by the packs that they're being issued. So we have very recently started working again with the SAS down at Campbell Barracks um, on a female military backpack solution. And there's a couple of SAS girls who are currently testing um, some packs that we've made especially for them. And so that's just a nice thing that we can do to, you know, again, these people are outside and, and, not only are they uncomfortable, but they're getting injured and we need to be able to go, okay, well, let's provide a solution so that we can actually help people to, you know, carry really big loads uh, in a reasonable fashion. And, you know, it's something we're passionate about and we're lucky enough to do it every day. What's, um, what's Ian currently up to uh, at the moment? And I, I get the impression he's reasonably semi-retired. Again, given that we didn't have a national conference this year because of the pandemic and we didn't get to see everybody and just, so in, um, I guess in a normal year, uh, dad would probably be, probably be off on some, um, well, probably would have just got back from some massive walk somewhere. Uh, last, uh, last year he did a um, 21 day uh, walk in um, Arctic Sweden. 
um, and uh, he's spending uh, significantly more time outside uh, than he has been um, in years gone by. And one thing that uh, has, I guess, he's been sort of pursuing is renewed passion now that we can't leave the state and because we're making panniers is he's really getting into um, into his cycle touring, uh, off-road cycle touring. So uh, the weekend before last, he went out for a um, three-day three 220K off-road tour. Um, so he's doing that and he's also, um, you know, spending as much time as he can uh, hiking and, uh, you know, taking photos. But in terms of what he's doing from a work point of view, uh, I don't think that he's the kind of person who can, can ever really retire and he's probably as busy from a work point of view as he ever has been. And the things that he's working on are, are those other sort of special project type things. Um, so we're working with the, um, the Swedish Special Forces uh, to develop a um, Arctic warfare tent um, and also a um, Arctic warfare pack, which is basically a um, 130 litre mountain expedition with um, with sled with uh, rings to tow a sled because those those guys are out there carrying between 40 and 80 kilograms on their backs on skis while towing a sled. So we're working on solutions for them, and um, that's a really sort of like leading edge piece of development that he's working really hard on at the moment. And um, while he is spending more time outside than uh, he has been in recent years, it doesn't necessarily mean that he's putting the brakes on from a work point of view. That is a very heavy pack for sure. Yeah, it's a, it's a I, crazy, I, crazy load. I, I, I don't think I could pick up that sort of weight and carry it on my back for more than 20 metres. Um, see you later, Jamie. Thanks for coming in. Thanks, Jamie. Um, Henry, it's it's been a fascinating and interesting journey. And uh, I think what I love most, uh, and having spent some time talking to Ian, both uh, here and in Perth, um, is uh, you just both have an amazing passion for WE and it comes through both in how you present and how you design stuff. And what I really particularly like is how uh, it's really always the equipment is related back to people actually using it for actual activity in the outdoors. And from my point of view, I think that's what, where the quality or shall we say, non-quality of equipment is proven. And uh, I've got lots of your equipment, which has been well proven. So from my point of view, thanks again for coming in. Thank you for having me. I'm always happy to, to join and uh, thank you for all the questions and uh, for giving me the time. Um, if anyone does have any questions in follow-up or is interested in, you know, for example, uh, buying a new set of panniers when they come out, you can always send me an email. Um, which is Henry. I'll write it in the. Uh, I'll write it in the chat. Uh, Henry at wildernessequipment.com.au. And um, there we go. That's correctly spelled. Yep. And uh, if anyone yeah has any questions in follow up, uh, like I said earlier, you know we come up with these kinds of things either when we're out having a run or having a shower later on. So you're probably like, oh, I wish that I'd asked him that. You can always just flick me an email and I'll be happy to field it. Pete, if I can, I've just got one quick question for Henry. It's actually a business opportunity, mate. I think we should make some retro SAS packs, bash them up, and then start selling them for a thousand bucks a pop. And I'll only <laughs> take ten percent, and you can take the rest of the bloody cash, and we'll all get rich. What do you reckon? I reckon we should go for it. I'll uh, yeah, send me an email. <laughs> Since the idea was thought of inside the outhouse, can we also get a percentage for inside the outhouse so that we can put some money towards this project? <laughs> inside the outhouse, inside the pack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's do it. Put our heads together, make it happen. Uh, Fantastic. Um, uh, um, does anyone else have any other questions or should we uh, have a chat or um, what are we going to talk about now? We could uh, potentially talk about uh, next week and uh, why uh, all your friends have not come into the outhouse anymore. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, where, where are all the people? Well, along those lines, um, for those of you here, uh, we will be sending out a survey to find out um, where people have gone, uh, why they're not here, and maybe hopefully ways to bring them back.
<laughs> so be sure I'll post it on the Facebook um, as well as it'll be sent out in an email. So if you know anybody, but anybody who might be interested in this, please share with them um, so that we can get some feedback and then hopefully amp things back up again. Or if you have any uh, topic suggestions or people who we should uh, have a chat to or interview inside the outhouse, then feel free to send us an email at contact at insidetheouthouse.org. And David, my good friend, will probably put that address in the chat as we speak.